welcome. You're listening to Latin Waves with your host, Sylvia and Stuart Richardson. Latin Waves is more than just hot rhythms. This is a show about community, about creating a culture that is inclusive and based on fairness. Because everyone deserves dignity, respect, and has something to contribute. A new world is possible, and it all starts with us. You're listening to Latin Ways and your host, Sylvia Richardson. I am delighted to have our guest, Abiba Chomsky. Dr. Chomsky is an American teacher. He's a, she's a historian and author of many wonderful books and also an activist. She's a professor at, of history and the coordinator of the Latin American, Latino, and Caribbean Studies at Salem State University. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. I, I love that you've written a book about Central America's forgotten history, revolution, violence, and the roots of migration. Especially after pandemic, after a year of pandemic where many people have been out of work, where we've faced the ravages of economic downturns that never got better since 2008. You know, it's easy to look for... Um, you know, for someone to scapegoat, you know, our economic failures and perhaps a lot of the things that we have. And in the past, I usually had fallen on the migrants who come to, to the States. But there is very little known about what caused their having to leave their country. So can you paint a picture of the role the United States has had in not only drafting, but in printing the fate of many Latin Americans, and particularly Central Americans, who are now migrants and refugees in many countries. Yeah, it's interesting to note that the countries where the United States has been the most deeply involved over the last two centuries, which is basically Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean countries, are the countries that are sending the largest numbers of migrants to the United States. And that's actually kind of a global pattern. That is, um, if you look at migration um, into Europe, it's predominantly people from Europe's former colonies. People from France's former colonies are going to France. People from Britain's former colonies are going to Britain. So you really see that these waves of migration, post-World War II migration, Cold War and post-Cold War migration, very closely follow the trails of colonialism, of centuries of colonialism. You know, we don't generally think of the United States as a colonial power, but our relationship with Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean has really been a colonial relationship. So uh, as a colonial relationship, it has been an extractive relationship where U.S. companies are taking land and forcing people to work for them. Um, in order to make profits and extract resources from the countries. And if any cent Central American, Caribbean country has decided to challenge that, the United States has not hesitated to use its military to move in and enforce it. Now, in the post-World War II period, um, supposedly it's been the period of decolonization when the former colonies, especially in Africa and Asia, gained their independence. The United States has continued to intervene economically, politically, militarily in its neo-colonies. And in Latin America, people often use the term neo-colonialism to refer to the period after formal independence when the countries are still economically, politically, and militarily dominated by first European powers and by the Around the middle or late 19th century, the United States has been the dominant neo-colonial power in, in Latin America. And its influence has been the strongest in Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So in the post-World War II period, the United States justified the economic model that it has been pushing on Central America with the language of modernization. That is, instead of justifying it through colonialism, through brute force, they justified it through modernization um, and even democratization. So the United States claimed that these policies um, of welcoming foreign investment, structural adjustment, that is, reducing state control over the economy, um, gutting the social welfare state, 
keeping taxes low for foreign corporations, maintaining strong control over the labor force, giving foreign corporations easy access to land, um, making sure there aren't too many environmental regulations. So basically a foreign investor friendly climate in the post-World War II period, this has been justified as the root to modernization and economic development. Mm. And this is the policy that the United States has been imposing on Central America since the middle of the 19th century. Um, and its result has been displacement, poverty, corruption, violence. And it's really kind of ironic to hear Joe Biden and Kamala Harris talking about the root causes of migration as being poverty, violence, and corruption, because what they forget is that poverty, violence, and corruption also have root causes. And the root causes are the policies that the United States has imposed on Central America. And they are exactly the same policies that Biden and Harris are now proposing supposedly as the solution to poverty, violence, and migration. But if those policies, corporate-friendly policies for the last 150 years, have only brought poverty, violence, and corruption, there seems to be no reason to hope that they're going to have a different result in 2021. I grew up during the 80s, you know, the dirty wars of the 80s with dead squads and bombs raining on people as a form of democratizing our, our governments and our, our people. To speak of empire at dinner tables is very unpolite. People don't want to talk about that. And we don't want to talk about living in the belly of empire. You know, most of us don't think that we live within, in, within an empire. You know, we think that the U.S. is a democratic country. We think that Canada is a, a broker of peace. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how the, the act of hegemony, you know, gets enforce because neoliberalism has been a way of forcing people to adapt to a way of being and seeing where all our health care is privatized, our education is privatized, our communication systems have been privatized. And this is so-called modernizing and creating more options for people. But for those of us who have suffered the democratization process, we only see more hunger. You know, in the case of El Salvador, 50% unemployment is the reality today. The gangs that have, you know, um, developed as a result of dead squads who became unemployed after the peace accords were signed are among some of the deadliest, right, in the region. And so can we talk about the connection between hegemony and empire and also the so-called tools or structures that are used to sustain it? So, I mean, first of all, I would say that if people in the United States and Canada don't think of their countries as empires, it's because they've never learned their country's history. That is, the United States was founded as an empire and has, from the very day it became independent, been an expansionist empire based on conquest, domination, displacement, removal of indigenous people. So if you look at a map of the 13 colonies in 1776 and look what happened in the century following 1776, how can you say that the United States is not an empire? I, mean, I hope that you can visualize this map of the 13 colonies versus what happened in the 100 years after independence. It was imperial expansion, territorial expansion. You know, we like to call it with euphemisms like manifest destiny, westward expansion to make it sound like something kind of normal and natural rather than violent, bloody conquest, displacement, extermination, genocide. So empire is built into the DNA of the United States. So that's where we need to begin in terms of understanding the United States and Canada as empires. But you asked specifically about what are some of the tools in the 21st century. Um, and in a lot of ways, they haven't changed a lot. Like if you go back to the 19th century, the way the U.S. empire is spreading into Central America is not all that different from the way it's spreading into the conquered territories in the Western United States. That is, it is imposing white supremacy. It is imposing corporate 
friendly policies. So if you look in Central America, um, the, the idea is that Central America will be a provider of primary resources controlled by U.S. corporations for the profits of U.S. corporations and for the benefits of U.S. consumers. So in the 19th century, that um, starts with the United Fruit Company based in here, here in Boston, my hometown, which takes over uh, significant portions of Central America's territory. If, if you read one of the United Fruit Company books that was published in the 1920s, it's called Conquest of the Tropics. And it's about how the, the United Fruit Company went about imposing its hegemony on so much of Central America. Coffee production was not so much in the hands of um, U.S. investors, but the coffee was primarily exported to the United States. And the financing, also a lot of it came from the United States. So a lot of the profits, and, and this also just shows how U.S. corporations are actually quite closely allied with Central American elites. That is, you know, you've heard of the 200 families in El Salvador who own all of the land and control all of the economy. Um, yes, and it's an export economy based on their relationships with U.S. importers, with U.S. bankers. You know, go back to 1906 and the Roosevelt corollary. This is Theodore Roosevelt to, um, to the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, Roosevelt said, if a country um, maintains order and pays its obligations, they have nothing to fear from the United States. But what if it doesn't maintain the kind of order that U.S. investors want? What if it doesn't pay its obligations, that is, its debts to U.S. corporations and U.S. banks and U.S. financiers? Then the United States invades. So the first half of the 20th century sees U.S. actual invasions and occupations and military rule in Haiti, in the Dominican Republic, in Nicaragua. So basically what they're saying is if Central American governments are docile and obedient and do everything the United States tells them and let U.S. corporations um, extract all the wealth from their country, the United States will let them rule. If they don't, the United States will try to overthrow them um, or, or will overthrow them. And, you know, that was really the policy until the United States failed in 1961 in Cuba, what the Cubans call la primera derrota del imperialismo yanqui en el hemisferio. The first defeat for U.S. imperialism in the hemisphere was the U.S. defeat at the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. You know, the United States has always had what, with respect to Cuba, they call track one and track two. So track one is brute force, the military option, the overthrow. Um, track two is trying to win hearts and minds with things like the Alliance for Progress, uh, the U.S. information service, uh, propaganda systems, trying to convince the uh, poor of Central America, Cuba, etc., that they're going to be better off not trying to bring about any kind of social change in their own interest, but uh, just being subject to U.S. domination. The the history is being written with blood, you know, in for us in, in El Salvador, I remember um, the mass demonstrations during the peace accords. Um, I was talking to relatives that were like on the streets at 3 a.m. as they ripped up the Constitution and rewrote it to allow for mining companies to have unfettered rights to certain areas, you know, and it literally was the just this welcoming mat for neoliberalism, whatever had not been privatized was now on the table. And it led to us losing our own currency. Right now, El Salvador has a dollar as its currency, which, as you know, that usually means you have zero <laughs> autonomy. Once you give up your currency, you really are at the U.S., you know, service because you, you really they can shut down the economy any second they want. You can sustain this kind of colonization by violence alone, right? The people, no people in this world want to be enslaved, as we've learned, you know, throughout history. No indigenous people wants to be slave of anyone. No black people will sustain that kind of oppression. You know, there, there's latent fires everywhere where people are ready to rise up and we see it today you know in venezuela their struggle of the people of venezuela to keep their government and to keep their 
autonomy to choose who they want as their government. You see it in Bolivia. You see it in so many parts of Latin America. So for me, I think it's important to recognize that hegemony cannot be sustained by force alone. It cannot be, there has to be a, some kind of authority, you know, that we grant. And, and so that's where the win the people track comes into place, right? Let's try to win them. And that, you know, when you own every medium of communication, you know, it seems like it's not going to be a difficult task because all the people here is whatever the U.S. news broadcasters want us to hear. But, but that hasn't been successful. And, Let's talk about the, the reasons why people continue to rebel despite the violence, despite the constant aggression, and, and why U.S. so-called authority that may have been believed at one time, you know, as a broker of democracy, has now disappeared. You are listening to Latin Waves. Our guest is Dr. Abiva Chomsky. Please consider supporting our work visit our website latinwaysmedia.com become a member for as little as one dollar thank you for listening it's really important to look at what happened in central america in the 1970s and 1980s when there were mass uprisings and revolutions popular revolutions against this u.s dominated order a successful revolution in nicaragua the revolutions in guatemala and el salvador that led to a decade of civil war um, dirty war financed by the United States against the revolutionary movements, uh, deemed a genocide in Guatemala by the United Nations against the indigenous population. So certainly the United States is still quite willing to use violence. And I think that the violence reverberates beyond just the moment in which it's carried out and the people who are killed and the governments who are overthrown. And um, William Blum wrote a book called Killing Hope, that one of the goals of the violence is to kill hope. That is to convince people that there is no alternative. That's a quote from Margaret Thatcher after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, that neoliberal capitalism is the only game left in town. Um, Tina, there is no alternative. And, you know, it's really interesting to look at what's going on in Cuba, not just at the time of the revolution in 1959, not just in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, but increasing in the 1990s and in the 21st century and, and up until today. The U.S. embargo, the stated purpose of the embargo, both then and now, is to destroy Cuba's economy so that people will think there's no alternative to capitalism, to show that socialism can't work, that socialism doesn't work, to convince people that socialism doesn't work by making it so. That is, um, as Henry Kissinger said in the case of Chile under Allende, to make the economy scream. So the stated, openly stated purpose of the U.S. embargo on Cuba is to turn people against their own government. Um, and again, there's kind of track one and track two. Track two is the propaganda campaign, the infiltration of Cuban organizations to try to turn them against the government, to try to promote um, opposition to the government and uh, support for the United States. Now, the United States has one really important thing going in its favor. It is the highest consuming and wealthiest and most powerful country in the world. So when the United States says, oh, look how well capitalism worked for us. So if you just do what we say, it'll work for you the same way. Um, but it's really obvious to Latin Americans and people in poor countries and even poor people in the United States that this is not the case, that capitalism works really well for rich people, but it works so well by draining the poor of their resources. And I'm talking here about the global poor that is there is no capitalism without colonialism. And, you know, way back in the 1960s and 1970s, Latin American economists started developing um, as a, a contradiction to or a challenge to modernization theory, dependency theory. That is the understanding that the rich countries got rich by extracting wealth from the countries that are now poor, 
so that Latin America's development and Africa's development and South Asia's development has been distorted by this colonial relationship. So if the colonizers are rich, it's because of the ways that they were able to exploit and extract resources from from the poor countries, um, from their colonies, which are now the third world or the poor countries of the world. So no country is is completely united that we can say like everybody in this country thinks one thing, no group of people, um, no voting block, no anything. But certainly there are many voices in Latin America. There are many voices in Latin America that just think there either there is no alternative or look how well capitalism works because it worked in the United States. That's what the United States wants people to think. Mm. That's what they expend huge amounts of weapons and propaganda on trying to make people think. Either there is no alternative, or look how well things work in the United States. I, I also think that it's very intriguing how the very victims then are made to bear the shame of the failure of their countries and think like, oh, we're escaping our corrupt governments. You know, there's so much corruption as if it's a natural thing that grows in that country. Or, you know, they're they're made to feel the shame of having been born poor, right? <laughs> Without acknowledging all the extraction that is happening on an ongoing basis that impoverishes on a constant basis, not just the lands and the sea and, you know, all the things that we are exploited from, uh, but also the people. Can can we, uh, as we come into the end, I wonder if you could talk about the kinds of um, movements that have maybe given you hope uh, within Latin America, because despite having the boot of imperialism on our neck and being so close to the violence and having the violence constantly reverberating, as it's a case of the recent coup in Honduras in 2008, you know, the ongoing violence that we face with embargoes to Cuba and, you know, the blockades and sanctions against Venezuela, we, we feel it all the time. There's always a constant fear that this too could happen to you. There has been some social movements that I think are worthy of note. And I wonder if you could talk about w what those are for you and how they keep you inspired and hopeful that we can transform our societies. I, I was talking about the revolutionary movements in Central America in the 1970s and the 1980s. And those came not only from poverty, repression, exploitation, they also came from conscientization, conscientización. So, uh, you know, I think that conscientization is kind of the, the missing link in what you were just talking about um, in terms of people just accepting the propaganda they hear from the United States versus processing it critically and having tools to analyze why are we poor. So I think there's a lot of that going on around Latin America, totally in contrast to what the United States was trying to impose. We have had the election of um, socialist and left-wing governments throughout Latin America. We have popular movements everywhere in Latin America protesting against neoliberalism, against uh, the takeover of their lands by foreign corporations. We have um, indigenous movements and peasant movements. And, you know, right now in the era of climate change, I think that a lot of these movements have the hope of resonance um, far beyond their borders. You know, talk about consciousness raising, like a lot of that has to go on in our wealthy first world countries too. But I think that climate change is really pushing us to acknowledge that, oh, you know, this model of development isn't working out so well, and maybe we can't do it. I love that you call it consciousness racing. You know, um, in the academy, people call it critical thinking and critical theory. And, you know, we have a lot of people who think that, you know, critical thinking is debate, right? <laughs> but for us in Latin America, being able to be curious and inquire and try to create a new way of being living you know in a way that we can coexist well um it means taking care of everybody you know is it in the service of people how will they help you know not just knowledge for knowledge's sake but rather 
a, a way to create a society where all beings are respected and have justice. Um, thank you for the beautiful history you have written, Central America's Forgotten History, Revolution, Violence, and the Roots of, Migra of, of Migration is a wonderful primer. Uh, what's your latest book, by the way? I know you just written another book, and I would love our audience to know about it. The Central America book came out in April, and another book also came out this past April that I am co-editor of called Organizing for Power, Labor in 21st Century Boston. Um, and I have another book in the works that's going to be published next April, also by Beacon Press, who published the Central America book, um, called Science is Not Enough, 40 Critical Questions About Climate Change. Wonderful. Oh, you are so amazing. Thank you so much for all that you do. And on those days when, you know, it just feels like um, the struggle is so much to bear, what keeps you excited and inspired to keep going? Writing. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Figuring things out, yes. like my own personal process of consciousness raising. Um, but Like, I just get so angry when I hear and read these kinds of unquestioning uh, defenses of the way the world is. Um, and so that challenge of figuring out, okay, what's wrong with that? And how can I explain it in the ways that people can understand? That's beautiful. Thank you so much for being with us. And thank you for the gift of your writing and for making history so accessible to, you know, to everyone, to people that want to learn and decolonize their mind. Because I think the, for me, colonization has been a kind of domestication to upset violence as a normal occurrence, to accept injustice as a way of being. And so I think to decolonize means to unlearn the ways we co-create and continuously sustain, you know, colonizing ways. So thank you again for all that you do and for being such a wonderful leader and uh, and a guide for, for many of us. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And mm -hmm. thanks for having me on your show. Take care. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Latin Waves. Latin Waves is an independently produced syndicated radio program made available for free to campus and community radios and also to the world at latinwavesmedia.com. Please visit the website to hear previous shows, hear about upcoming events, and consider becoming a member for as little as $1 per month.